All right, let's get started now that AV is working <coughs> before it breaks again. Apparently there's a limitation with Chromebooks <laughs> that I did not expect. Hello, uh, welcome to my talk. I'm Justin, obviously, the slide said so. Um, this is talk about cloud native infrastructure. Thanks for sticking around this wet day on a Saturday. Uh, who here is first time at scale? Yeah, I love it. It just keeps new people and this is great because I've been coming to scale for a very long time. So uh, comments or anything about it, you can hit me up. I'm on Twitter, Rothgar. Uh, I talk to a lot of people on there, so always glad to talk. Um, that's going to suck if that doesn't do what I think it should. That does. OK. Um, so just a little about me, uh, the, the standard who is slide, or the ID command as well. Um, I really love communities, uh, open source communities especially. I've been coming to scale for a long time. I'm super involved with uh, the Kubernetes community. Before then, was really involved in um, config management. And uh, just really love kind of learning what people are doing with things and the diversity of, of what we can all kind of build together. Um, obviously, open source software is in there. And I, I typically always run Linux on the desktop, and I'm a strong proponent for that. And I think it's great. Um, Chrome OS is technically Linux on the desktop, uh, just limited, and that's OK. Um, but really, like this talk is all about lots of things that I've thought about um, with cloud infrastructure and, and how to be successful running infrastructure or running anything in a cloud environment. And what does that mean? And um, through, you know, I, through a lot of thinking about it, a, a lot of just seeing what other people have done, um, I, I am involved in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. I'm one of their CNCF ambassadors and, uh, and, and kind of have been able to learn a lot from the community from, from that. Here is the uh, standard CNCF uh, slide that everyone puts in any, any talk that says cloud in it. And uh, I'm sorry that this resolution <laughs> really sucks, but it doesn't matter because the slide sucks. Um, <laughs> This thing is, is kind of terrible, um, and I, I think it's terrible for two reasons. Uh, one is, this was never made for anyone in this room, probably. This is, this is not meant for engineers or for people that are building systems. This slide, this piece right here, was made for partners of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation so that they can see what other products exist and who else is involved with the CNCF. And so if you're an engineer and you look at this and you say, wow, I don't know what to do now. It's OK, because it was never meant for you. Um, and really, it's, it's just a bunch of tools, right? Like, like everything on here is just like, oh, I can use that for something. I can use that for something. And I'm, I'm also a big proponent for visual learning. And I like props. Um, so I have a couple for today. And this is a tool catalog called Cool Tools. And literally, it's just like a big book of a bunch of stuff that you probably didn't know existed. Uh, does anyone? need to, let's see, oh, they have like some nice garden and seed catalog, cat, uh, you know, systems for sorting things. It's just random anything you could think of. But I really love the, the tagline on it was a catalog of possibilities. This wasn't tools specifically. This is like, hey, look at all the things you can actually do. Like, I don't care if you buy another like special wrench or something like that. Like, the, the cool thing is the possibilities that come out of this if you actually know that the tool exists. And, and that to me is kind of the key thing, that this doesn't show, right? This is just a list of tools, and, and who cares? And so, I mean, I, I kind of equate that slide deck to a toolbox. Like, here you go. Like, what are you going to do with these tools? I mean, if you just look at them there, it's like, well, you know, the top drawer is kind of organized. The bottom one's not. Thank you. It's Thomas in here. Thank you for the picture. That was, could not find a picture online that did this. So someone sent me one. It was great. But you can, you can hurt yourself with a lot of these things, right? Like, this isn't necessarily a good thing to put tools in everyone's hand. Like, not everyone can use, you know, one of these wrenches necessarily. Like, they, they might hurt themselves. And they can do bad things with it. And, and, and that's kind of an important thing to think about. Like, if we have, say we want to hang a picture, you know, it's a nice picture. We, we want to make sure this is going to look nice on our wall, right? Standard tool, if you know what you're doing, you know, you can go go pick a hammer and go get a nail. But you know, some people will automatically just say, like, OK, well, I, I have this tool, and I love this tool. So this is what I'm going to do with it. You know, in, can you hang a picture with a chainsaw? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I'm sure someone, you know. 
right? Like, like, I mean, but how often have you seen people do this in technology, right? Like, hey, guess what? I need to do this thing. Like, well, wait a minute. I got something for you. It's like, no, like, that's not the point of these tools. Like, you just pick the completely wrong tool for the job. But then there's another problem of like, okay, I want to go to Hawaii, right? Like, I, I really want to go there. I need a boat. And I, I just, you know, how am I going to get to Hawaii? Because it's obviously a distance here from, from L.A. down to Hawaii. So, you know what, like, I'm going to pick, that's the boat that I have. So we're good, right? And I'll get, like, 10 feet offshore. I'm just like, well, you know what, no, I'll just, I'll just stay here. It's fine. It's, it's raining. And so, you, again, you're like, oh, well, this is the right tool for the job. But you have to think of what is, what is the end goal? Like, where am I going with this? And, and how can I be successful getting to Hawaii with a boat? And that's not the way you're successful. But then, you know, sometimes there's this one tool that is just great. And you're just like, you know what? I can do anything with this. And, and you can do a whole bunch of stuff with that tool. That's absolutely for sure. But it's not just about one tool. Because this by itself is not going to build, you know, the, the Falcon 9. Like, you just can't do it. Like, you have to know when to use the right tool and, and how they fit together. And, and you know... I could just imagine someone trying to use, you know, the same tool for everything. And there is one exception to that. I mean, Bash is the way that, <laughs> I, like, that will fit every problem. I don't care. And, and you might have a problem with scale, you know, but, you know, it's, it's going to work for you. So, so back to this slide, right? Because this is just a bunch of tools that we may or may not know how to use them. Might hurt ourselves. It's fine. But the other thing is, like, does anyone know, I, I hid one extra icon on here. If someone can find it for me, you, like, you win a bonus right now. Like, right? I, yeah, right, let's go here, I'll help you out. It's right there, okay? It's this new infrastructure, uh, you know, it's, it's a book that I wrote with uh, my friend, uh, Chris Nova. Uh, we wrote it last year, and it's all about these patterns that uh, you can use when building infrastructure in a cloud environment. Uh, I'm not going to spoil anything in the book today because I've heard not everyone here has read it. It's okay. Um, you'll, you'll be able to hear all about it with the new Netflix original that's coming out. So kind of <laughs> in the works on that, but you know, it's, it's kind of getting a rough start. The book was better. Okay. That's <laughs> glad we have agreement on that. So, uh, but yeah, if you want more information, go there. Uh, we spent a lot of time last year um, working on this and, and just kind of figuring out these patterns and, and pulling them out of not only all those projects that are, you know, part of the CNCF, but also how other companies were successful in cloud environments and what they did to make themselves successful. And so there's really only one question that I kind of want to answer that that's kind of talked about in the book. But the main question I want to answer today is why? Like, why this cloud native thing? Like, what? okay, we had... All terms after terms after terms, and it's always like, well, what, what's the, like, why do I care? Like, what, what am I going to do with this? What's the point? And, and really, like, the main thing of cloud native to me is this state where it's cloud native means you think about problems in a cloud context. It doesn't mean that the cloud exists. It doesn't mean that you say, oh, Amazon's there, right? Like, so I should just take all my stuff and run it in Amazon. Like, that's not what you're doing here. Like, that's, it's not a matter of just, you know, baseline of it exists. It's actually like, well, what if everything was there? What if we did everything, not just the tooling and the systems and the products, but what if, like, our processes had, were involved with what the cloud does? And what if, like, people actually thought about it natively as, well, this is all the stuff that exists. How should we use that? Like, let's, let's go deeper than just a slide of tools. And uh, when you do that, it really comes down to, culture as well, where, where culture will eat process for, for breakfast or whatever the saying is, where, where if, if your people are thinking about it in this context where you say, okay, it doesn't run this way, I don't manage it this way, I manage it in how Amazon or how Google or how Microsoft, how they are successful running this, then, then let's start there and see what we build. And with that, you start solving the problems that way, where it changes just how you think about it. Instead of saying, well, I need to automate all this stuff to save some time, instead you say, well, what does Amazon, like, how does Amazon want me to run something? Well, they have, you know, auto-scaling groups, so I probably want something that can auto-scale. Well, they have 
uh, database as a service. So I, I probably should use that if I can. Like, there's no point in, oh, let me, you know, try to make my own auto-scaling group with my SQL shards. Like, why? Like, wh what was the point of building that when you can just click a button and get it from Amazon from the API? And so you solve problems different. Uh, and you only build the, little, the parts that you act, they actually differentiate you, the things that you can't get from one of these service providers. And that's important because service providers keep giving you more and more stuff. I mean, how many products were launched to AWS? It was over 100. But it's, it's really, like, they're not slowing down. Like, they're, they have whole, like, thousands, you know, tens of thousands of people working on this stuff, and they're just accelerating the products they provide. And so why do you need to, why are you better at doing that thing. Like, yes, there are things that differentiate you, and that's good. But so what does it mean to actually solve problems this way? Like, okay, that still didn't answer the, the why. <laughs> it's, it's just like, okay, well, I, I need to think about things different, right? Um, and so when you think about things differently and you're able to consume resources from a third party and you're able to not only build what is necessary, you actually will change how you forecast what's possible. If a Kubernetes cluster today takes you a week to stand up, okay, well, I need to build a product top of Kubernetes, so I need at least a week plus a day? I don't know. If the Kubernetes cluster, in, if you get a GKE cluster, guess what? That took 10 seconds, a minute maybe. Like, how, okay, well, now I need 10 minutes in a day still? I don't know. Like, some, there's some factor in there of what's possible, and, and by looking into the future, by just extrapolating that out and saying, okay, well, six months from now, I hope to be, you know, have this product out there and deployed, but I need to stand up all these things in front of it. So there's a lot of context that you need to, to all these things you need to build beforehand. And in, in a cloud environment, if you actually consume those resources and build as minimal as possible, you can just say, oh, well, guess what? Like, six months, I can shrink that down to you know, a couple weeks. And it's just a matter of getting the applications there and making sure you use the right tools in each provider. Uh, and there are absolutely things to figure out. Like, it is a different environment. It's not just all sunshine and rainbows. Um, there are technical, you know, hard engineering problems. But don't get caught up on the little things. Don't say, I have to run Postgres because I've always run Postgres and that's how it is. Click the button. See if you can use their Postgres and go with it. And then that also allows you to only focus on the things that differentiate you. What is your business logic? How is your business logic different than the other companies? We only build that. Don't build the things that are the same, if you can. If, if everyone needs uh, Elk Stack, then, you know, like, hey, guess what? Like, you're building an Elk Stack, they're building an Elk Stack, but guess what? There's a hosted version of it that you can click a button. And yes, there might be limitations. Yes, it might be an older version. You do have to work around those things and understand how that fits. But Try as much as possible to focus only on your business logic and the thing that differentiate you. And so as you, know, as you just extrapolate this out, if I say you know, something was going to take me a year to build this thing, it actually will, in the future, it'll change what is possible just straight out. Because you'll think about things different. And you won't say, you know, that project is going to take such a long time. No, like you literally will build a different way because you say, no, I can do that in a week and we're fine. And this also brings up the question of if, if a cloud provider is running all of your, this, this infrastructure for you, what if you were doing that as well? What if you were just writing applications that managed the pieces that were unique to you? The business logic that didn't apply to someone else, if, if applications ran your infrastructure for the things that you also were building. You're not building scripts and automation, you're building applications that are APIs and they're declarative. And with that, you can use the exact same model, you're, you're consuming these resources from a cloud provider, you can now consume them from your own APIs. Any other math people in here? I was a math major, and yeah, so. Uh, distance equals speed times time. And so how far you're gonna actually travel matters how fast you're going and how long you're doing that. And so in this context, uh, you know, in technology, where we kind of start, which, which literally every day we start new, like everyone is at this point. Yes, you have legacy. Yes, there's a, a bunch of stuff that you need to bring along with you. Um, so that might be, a, a, you know, starting a little backwards. But how fast you can move and how long you're going to do it is, is going to determine what's possible and, and what you're able to do. And so 
like to kind of set some of this in context, I'm going to tell a bit of a story here of kind of looking back in time of, of where we've kind of come and other things we've kind of built. And, and with the story, we're kind of, I'll show you. We're, we're going to start here with, with this imaginary race that we're going to do. We're just going to try to see how fast we can get from here to the Pasadena Convention Center, right? We're going to see how fast we can get to New York, okay? You got to watch out, like in Illinois over here, there's some construction, but it's fine. We can probably detour around it. Um, and so with your legacy stuff, yeah, that might drag you back. You might be starting back in Hawaii. You might need to bring your infrastructure up or, or there's, I'm sure, legacy stuff. But like startups that are starting now, guess what? They don't have that and they're moving fast. So if you don't think they can disrupt you, guess what? They're going to move faster and have a further starting point. And they can go further because time for all of us is going to be the same starting you know, today, tomorrow. It just matters how fast you can go. But here's the other thing. In this context, anyone know what these are? These Haynes manuals? This is my personal, like it's all oily because I used it a lot. I had an MR2 and it was great. I just love that car. Um, but you got to build it all yourself. Like if this is the, if this is the thing, we got to build our own car to get from, from Pasadena to New York. So like this book literally is a full teardown of the entire car, engine, body, everything. Like you can just go through it and you're like, okay, well, let me get on the phone and call some people. I'm going to order some parts and we're going to build a car, right? And we're going to drive over to New York. It's like, if you think about, like, that's the, the mindset when we're like, let's build a data center, right? Like, like I want to go, I need to go do this thing. Like, my end goal is this application is running and it's scalable. And it's like, but I want to build a car. Like, it, some of that stuff just doesn't line up sometimes. And it's a problem, especially historically, like, this was your toolbox. Like, what are you going to build with those tools? It's like, I, you know, I'm not building this right here. Like, I can't do some fine-tuning and, and some other things if this is my toolbox, right? If this is all you have, which, I mean, like, there's Pearl right there. There's some COBOL over here. You know, like, like, you can call out these tools and, like, you have them in your stack somewhere. And if that's what you have and you're not changing that and you're not, you're not going to, you know, use someone else's resources, this is what you're going to build. I swear I SSH'd into that wagon when I first started. Like... <laughs> That was like as bespoke as they come, you know, like as many puns as I can get off of this. Um, but really, I mean, like that's, that's what you started with, with those tools. And it was great for the time, right? You could do a lot with that. And, and those could go, you know how fast those things can go? Five-sixths of a mile per hour. That's, that's flying, right? And they go about 10 to 20 miles a day. And that's it. She's like, okay, we don't. 10 miles. Like, if I was driving home from Pasadena right now, it would take me four days to get home. <laughs> like, like, no, that's just not the thing anymore. Like, we, we can do better, right? And they also need something else. They needed some other, like, cooperation. They couldn't do it all themselves with this covered wagon. Like, yes, you know, way back in the day, like, Oregon Trail style, like, yeah, there was some pretty rough going, and you can kind of make it, but you're not going to go 10 miles an hour. Um, so as roads were built, they could start to move faster, and they could go a little bit further, and this is like, for, like early ARPANET kind of stuff or just like paving roads of like what was possible when computers were first starting out and what we were able to do with them. But over time, people started getting better at manufacturing things and they're better at building these tools to build better products. And this is a, uh, what was it, a 1900 Riker Electric. Has anyone ever heard of this? Okay, that's what I thought, it's awesome. At the, there's a Peterson Museum down here in L.A., and they have one there. And I was just like, when I saw it, I'm like, they had electric cars back then? 100-mile range, electric car, electric horseless carriage. I was like, what? Like, the first version, like, Volts didn't do that. Like, how? And I just want, there's a, I found a, uh, like, a advertisement for it. I just got to read this because this is like, I swear, some technology company has tried to sell me this product with this as their, as their blurb. Okay. The perfect automobile represent the last step in perfection of automobiles, vibration has been completely overcome. Look at those rubber tires right there. That's like hard rubber right there. Absolute control of speed and direction has been secured. The minimum cost of operation and the highest degree of durability has been attained. Anyone else have that product in their stack right now? I do. Every requirement of pleasure for business, every demand for beauty and service, or, and service supplied by the Riker electric vehicle, right? They're selling a support contract. <laughs> like, that's literally like what they're doing here. It's like, okay, well, 
yeah, like, that sounds like a good product. I'll buy that. I can, I can go faster than my carriage, right? So we're good. And here are the sysadmins building it, right? Like, they're building infrastructure right now, right? They're like, let's buy all these parts and stick them together. And that wheel goes here. And it's like, that's what you had to do. And, and it's still, it's like, okay, well, let's, what was the point? Oh, yeah, we're trying to go to New York. I forgot. Like, we're building this stuff. And, and we sometimes forget where we're going. And this guy came along. Anyone? Henry Ford, right? Don't really, not, you know, the best person in, in all of history, but did some great things for moving industry ahead. And I, a little aside about him, as I was obviously doing research for this talk, pretty fascinating. He grew up on a farm, which he hated. He had uh, two sisters and two brothers. His mom died when he was 13, and he moved out when he was 16. He's like, forget this. I'm going to go be a machinist. And so he moved up to Detroit. And he's like, ah, that's it. You know, no more farm for me. I'm going to be a mach mach machinist. Uh, yeah, that failed. Uh, he moved back home three years later, um, right back out of college. And uh, then he, when he came home, his dad had a steam engine, and he learned to work on it. And it was a Westinghouse steam engine. So he was like, well, I'll tinker with this thing. And he's like, oh, I kind of like this. And, and so he got good at it, and Westinghouse ended up hiring him to work on their steam engines. He's like, well, this is, is kind of cool. Uh, he then, Edison somehow found him, and he's like, oh, well, let's go. Edison wants him to be an engineer for Edison, and building whatever. Edison built all sorts of stuff. And so he's like, yeah, that sounds great. Works his way up to be chief engineer at, at Edison. And uh, I think he was building, like, a Rails app or something. It was... <laughs> uh, and then he started to get really bored. Because he's like, you know what? Like, this, this just isn't working out. Like, I'm, I need to do some other side projects. And so one of his side projects was this thing. It was called the Quadricycle. And he's like, you know, this, is, this might be working out. So he left Edison. He's like, you know what? We're good. I'm going to do this. He left Edison. He started the Detroit Automobile Company. Two years later, completely bankrupt. Failed miserably. Uh, so that same year, he's like, fine. I'm going to restart this again. The Henry Ford Company. Uh, he was the chief engineer. And, and it wasn't doing too good. I don't know what VCs funded it then, but uh, they, so they brought in another engineer. He was like the guy in charge for engineering. And they're like, okay, we're going to bring in someone else to help you out. And he's like, no, I don't, I don't really like that. And so he left. And, uh, and later, that, you know, that, the company went on. They changed their name. The guy they brought in kind of renamed it to Cadillac, so they worked out anyway. Uh, but then he was like, okay, well, I'm going to start this new company, right? Th third startup. Let's go, let's go ahead and do this. And it was called the Ford and Malcolmson. Malcolm's son, uh, but they borrowed a bunch of money to get parts uh, from these two guys that had a garage. And so they're like, we're going to build cars better than we could at, at dumb Cadillac, right? And so they, buy, they get all these parts, and it was a couple years later, and these, the, the brothers that ran the garage, they were it, the Dodge brothers, of course. Um, and so they, they literally, like the Dodge brothers went up and like, we need money for those parts because like, we're doing our own thing, and, and we need you to pay us back. And he's like, well, like, I don't have any money. Like, we can't sell things of what we're, what we're doing right now. So, like, okay, fine. I'm going to start another company. We're going to reincorporate here. We're going to call this one the Ford Motor Company, right? And, and then you can, Dodge Brothers, you can have part of this new company. I don't know why they signed off on it. His track record wasn't super great. Um, but so they start the Ford Motor Company. And, and five years into that company, now, you know, failure after failure after failure, he comes up with this thing, right? The Ford Model T. Looks, looks all right, you know, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, it, it was 1908 when it came out. Did a bunch of things that were really cool, uh, like standardized things. Uh, you know, it depends on what country you're from, but like steering wheel on the left was like a standard now. Like Model T did that and then like everyone followed it. Um, but really the, the thing that he did that was great was he made it so cheap, it was, he just democratized it. So like everyone could afford it, right? Because these cars were so, they were so expensive to build and do before and, and, and so no one could afford them. And so now, like, 10 years after this came out, half of the cars on the road were Ford Model Ts. Half of the cars. Could you imagine if technology, if everyone used, if half of technology used one product? Like, that would be a super successful product. And that's exactly what he did with cars. And, and the way he scaled it was with CICD, right? Like, he just said, like, well, you know what? We need some sort of pipeline here to build these cars. We can't get them out fast enough. And so we have to come up with something that lets us deliver cars constantly and just get them out the door. And funny fact about 
well, in, CICD pipelines are, are fascinating, and, and you're always kind of tweaking things. And uh, who has like build optimizations in their CD pipeline just to make things like a little faster to like, hey, you know what, like that build's taking forever. Like let's, let's speed it up a little bit. So the Model T, it was the first five years it came out, you couldn't buy black. Black was not an option until they came out with this. Black was this the continuous delivery optimization. He's like, well, you know what, if everything was just black, we'd be good. Like we wouldn't have to do all these customizations. Uh, there's stories about like the black paint dried faster so they could start working on the parts better and, and all these things where he's just like, you know what, like we need to get things out. So originally the colors were, it was green, blue, gray, and red. And like every quote after this was, Ford was like, yeah, they can have any color they want as long as it's black. It's like, yeah, because, you know, that's what let him do this. And, and so he figured out, like, okay, well, we need to do it this way. We need a CD pipeline that continues delivery. And he also did some other really cool things um, as far as, like, a 40-hour work week. Anyone work 40 hours a week? That's great. Before then, it was always 48. Like, Ford did that for you. Congratulations. Uh, and, and he introduced five... $5 a day for pay versus two, $2 to two fifty is what everyone else is paying. So it was great. Like he was like, well, you know what? I need to retain workers better. And by doing that, I'm going to pay them more money. And if I pay them more money, because he had ch churn over all these people working these lines. And so he's like, well, you know what? If they make more money, I can keep them for longer. Not everything was perfect that Ford did. If you want to search for Fordlandia, anyone's ever heard of that? He built a whole town. It's an amazing catastrophe. Um, there's a 99% Invisible episode, podcast that came out. That's if you search for it with Fordlandia. It's really fascinating. But really, the, the thing that came out of this was Ford went down there, and he's like, well, I, I was super successful here, so I'm going to do that over in, in Brazil, right? That's where all the rubber came from. And there was these rubber cartels that he was worried that he wasn't going to be able to get his rubber. And so I'm not going to go into all of it, but essentially, culture matters a lot by just taking what you had here and making it down there, like the culture was completely different. It all failed and it was quite interesting. Um, and then the other thing was, you know, roads started to get better because, you know, this Model T, or everything was, you know, building on, on itself. And if Ford had decided like, no, like I'm only gonna build on my roads, my custom roads and it's proprietary, like guess what? He wouldn't have got very far. Um, but infrastructure was being built to, to help maintain that. And, you know, throughout the 40s and 50s, there was a whole bunch of, plans to, for interna interstate plans, which actually, this is the 101, uh, which is right over here in Pasadena, which was the first highway in the United States. Super fascinating. Uh, if you drive on it, you'll see like where the two lanes originally were. And it's super windy. It's not like much of a highway that we think of today. Uh, so yeah, so beyond this, you know, Tools got better, you know, our processes got better. And, and now like our processes for cars look like this, and, right? And it's an automated build system. You're not like figuring out and manually fixing all these build processes, you have machines do that. And, and those machines are really good at their job. And yeah, there's still some things that, you know, pop up here and there and, and you gotta tweak them. Um, but for the most part, like they just, just go and we're good. And that gets us to build our car faster, right? Because remember, we're going to New York. Oh, I almost forgot. Um, and, like, these processes have gotten so good that now it's this, right? And, like, it's, well, like, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, is this cloud native? I, I would say no. Um, this is DevOps native because, like, you know, get that acceleration to apply the same principles of, of building software and a, but use that as infrastructure as code and, and make your code JSON files because that's cool. And... And, you know, put all those JSON files in a directory and then run some tool to build it for you. And it's like, well, yeah, like, that's a better representation of it. But it's still just a static directory of text. Like, what, how does that help me in any way? I still have to go write a bunch of text. Yeah. Is it cloud native if I shove it into a Lambda function? We're getting there. Don't jump ahead. Come on. <laughs> he asks if it's cloud native it's in a, if it's in a Lambda function. Um, Uh, so yeah, all this infrastructure and all these things that we're building, like what did that get us? It like essentially got us a data center. And it's like, wow, that's a cool data center, man. Like, like now you can use it. Now you can go somewhere. This was my first car. It's 83 Honda Civic. It was a terrible car. It's actually that's not my picture. I didn't have any pictures of my car because it only lasted a month before it died. Um, but, like, you have data centers to, like, get us places now, right? Like, that's what we build on. We build all this infrastructure up, and we manually do these processes, and we automate some of it, but we can build, like, a really ugly thing. Um, some people's data centers look cooler than others. 
we'll say. Uh, some of them, like, I mean, this is, congratulations, like, this one's kind of automated, right? I can, I can do autopilot for a lot of things, and, and some of it works out. Uh, the, the NVIDIA chips in this, there's, like, two NVIDIA chips for the, the self-driving, uh, like, detecting what's around it. It's the power, equivalent power of 150 MacBook Pros. That's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, you know, it's in, it's in my car. Um, but it's still just like, okay, we're still just driving a car to New York, right? And it's like, okay, that's, that's great, but it's not, it's not changing how we forecast things of what's possible, right? We want to accelerate what we're doing, and we want to be able to go further with all this stuff. And so another model for that, like, hey, what if you didn't have to buy the car? What if you could just, like, get a car right now? And that's more of the, you know, like, the cloud exists. Like, this is a declarative, like, I just want to rent this thing for a little while and get me from point A to point B, right? And in some cases, that's great uh, because, you know, that's all you need. You don't, you don't need to spin up everything. You don't need to own everything. You just want to go one place to another. And interesting, like, thinking about it from when I'm driving a car, if I want to go here to, let's say, the beach, I'm going to come out here, I'm going to go up the street, I'm going to turn left, I'm going to go down 101, I'm going to, you know, I'm doing left, right, all the way. It's an imperative way to get there, where I just say, like, I need to, I need to control every turn and every light. If I get lost along the way, that sucks, and I have to figure out where to go. I have to, I mean, I could pull up my phone and figure it out, it might reroute me, but I need to then make the changes to get there. Whereas in this model, this is declarative. You say, I want to go to the beach. You don't, you'll get to the beach. It's fine. Like, you sit in the back seat. You read your phone. The driver figures it out. There is someone doing imperative work that gets you from point A to point B. But for you, it's declarative. You just, you're just a consumer of that, and you say, I need to go there. And if the, you know, if your Lyft driver gets lost, you know, like, he'll figure it out. Like, you don't have to at that point because you are just a consumer of this service. And that's literally what declarative you know, APIs give you in a cloud, where you're like, I just need this thing. Amazon doesn't, like, tell you to, like, oh, we'll figure out where it fits. Like, where does that VM fit in our infrastructure? Like, they don't care. Like, the, you'll get a VM, right? And you get an IP address. And that's great. And then you can also automate the driver out, obviously. Um, and, and this is still, like, a great model. You request this Google, if anyone doesn't know, this is a Google Waymo's uh, self-driving car. This is their first prototype, which is completely driverless. There's no steering wheel. You request it in an app, and it just shows up and drives where you want to go, uh, which is really amazing that we can do that now. Uh, and it, you know, it's fully automated, but it's not going to go, like, super far. And, and we may not get to our destination if we're really trying to get all the way to New York. We'll get really far. We, it might take us longer. We'll have to stop and charge, or we could maybe request another one. Like, we have to limp along and do these kinds of things. Um, so it really, like, again, back to this... Like, we want, we're starting here in Pasadena. Time is, is we want to get there as short as possible, but, you know, if you switch the equation around, like, let's get to New York as short as possible. So what's the other way we can do that? Well, we can go faster. We can literally accelerate ourselves faster than we could by just driving there. And that's just another way to think about it where, okay, this exists, and, and airplanes are completely declarative, right? Like, who here owns their own airplane? Like, who built one and... Okay, yeah, you can leave. I'm sorry. <laughs> Have fun with your data center. Uh, but no, like, like we just we buy a ticket, we show up, we scan a little barcode, and it flies us somewhere. And like, even the pilots don't fly the planes anymore, right? Like the the planes fly themselves. They just sit there, um, and and you know, play on their iPads or whatever. And and really like. This isn't saying DevOps doesn't matter, right? All of these processes to get us to these places, like we should still use these practices. This process of uh, deploying applications fast and, and using that same thing to do everything for, you know, testable infrastructure and testable code is really important. And, and DevOps really drove that home for applications going to get out the door really fast. But, you know, like infrastructure started becoming this bottleneck where guess what? Like now we can't change infrastructure fast. Like the application can change fast over and over again. They can switch, you know, whatever JavaScript libraries out today versus the one tomorrow, that's fine. Like, the application doesn't care. But if now it needs different infrastructure, like, that's a little bit harder to change. And so in, in cloud-native infrastructure, it's really about being able to change that infrastructure as fast as you can change those applications and, and running them different. And if you're, if you're already running in, like, a, a function as a service or a, a platform as a service, and you don't care about infrastructure, congratulations, you don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Like, that is a solved problem for you if everything you run fits in that environment. 
you're going to have different problems, if you're just, but you're not going to worry about, oh, that server didn't come up, come up because you don't worry about servers anymore. Like you only worry about your application. So that's really good. And, and this just really applies. Like it's just the same thing at a bigger scale in a lot of cases, right? CD, it's, you know, we're just running more stuff to build more things. I mean, these are way more complex than the Model T. And, and we can build a bigger thing, and, and they can just push them out as fast as possible. Um, and, and what if, again, like going back to, like what if, what, if you're the what if the infrastructure was actually managed by applications? Like what if you did run Terraform in a Lambda function? How would you do that? Like how would you get Terraform to call something for you to build infrastructure? It's like, well, you would call an API. You would declare this API. And like, that's good for like a one time, like, hey, something went out there and did something. But what you really want is this control loop pattern where you don't want just like a one time push and then things are there because that drifts and things, you know, it, it never looks the same the next day because you don't manage everything. Like, in, I mean, immutable infrastructure, there's all these things, but immutability only is, has, has a limited scope. Like a, a RPM is a immutable package of a thing, right? But it mutates the OS that it's in. And if you change the OS, that, it, that mutates the infrastructure that that's in. They all have immutability, like, doesn't make sense unless you look at the whole picture. And so unless your entire thing, like, your entire infrastructure is immutable, like, you're, you're going to have mutations here and there, and it's always going to drift. And so you need these control loops that, that give you that kind of, f not feedback, but, like, constant management of your infrastructure and constant applying of what the desired state is. Like, what is it that you want? And then something looks at that, and it's an application that constantly runs. It's not infrastructure as code. It's not a static thing of code. It's actually an application running. It's infrastructure as software. And the software runs, and it does these loops, and you tell it, I want an airplane. And it will make that happen. The application does imperative things behind the scenes, but it gives you an abstraction. Because you're not saying, I want you know, this blade, and I want this thing, and I want this wing. No, no, like, I want an airplane. And if you set up the declarative applications to do the right thing, it abstracts away everything under that for you. And you can build those applications yourselves. You should be building those applications to manage your infrastructure, not just automation scripts that do something one time. Um, config management tools are great at this at the OS level, right? You can, you can declare, like, I want my OS to have this configuration. But it's always a little limited in scope. It doesn't do everything on the box. It only does the things you tell it about. And, and, and they don't coordinate things. Like, I can't tell Puppet that, like, hey, just give me a WordPress. It's like, well, no, no, I got to go through and I got to write all the code that, like, kind of does that. And then Puppet runs and it spins up WordPress. But if Puppet doesn't run again, like, guess what? Like, things can crash. Like, WordPress can go away. Um, and, and that's a problem. Like, having this software continually running, that's literally a pattern inside of a lot of the cloud native, especially in Kubernetes, that's the control loop pattern, where literally you call the API and say, I want a pod to run, and Kubernetes says, okay, I will figure out what it means to make a pod running. And it's an abstraction for you. You don't really care. Like, well, if this pod runs something, and Kubernetes figures the rest of it out, and it constantly applies that. When a pod dies, it makes sure that another one's running. And that allows us to really go faster. Like, that's how we accelerate these things. It's not a matter of a human running Terraform apply. It's a matter of software managing the software, managing the infrastructure. It does that for you. Software is way better at us than all, at a lot of these things. Like we can control the business logic, but as much as possible, you should really try to like put what your, your knowledge into abstracted applications and APIs. And if you can do that, you can move super fast. And that's the pattern that like Netflix does and Google does. And like Chaos Monkeys are like software that runs in the infrastructure. It's like the opposite of what I'm talking about. It's like it destroys things. But it's software that runs and it figures out what's there and it says, hey, I want to kill something. And it just starts killing things off. Instead of creating them, it does the opposite. And, and it literally is that pattern of a control loop software running in the infrastructure to manage infrastructure, in that case, killing it. Um, Anyone know why the nose on these things points down? I didn't, I, I didn't know. Yeah, it's like it's, it's observability for the pilots when they're landing and taking off. Because at flight, it actually like goes up straight. And so when they're, when they're going at speed, like it's not cocked down like that. But like the pilots can't see the ground when they're flying around. I just thought that was so fascinating that someone's like, you know, like, well, what do we do? Like if the pilot can't see, like, ah, do they really care? Like, I mean, they, all these, I mean, this was, you know, built 
long time ago, so they didn't have, like, oh, let's just do a webcam or something like that. No, they had to figure out a mechanical solution to solve this problem. And so to increase their observability, they literally just like, well, let's just make the nose go down, and you can see the ground now. And, and you know, that was a, a design decision they had to make to allow this to happen, or allow this plane to be super successful and really fast. This, these things would go Mach, over Mach 2, like twice the speed of sound. You can get from here to Par or from New York to Paris in three and a half hours. A standard flight from New York to Paris is double that. You're, you're going a little more than seven hours. It's like, wow, like think of what you can do if you could move that fast. That flight also costs you $8,000. So, you know, you have to weigh, like, how fast do I need to get there? Maybe I don't need that three and a half hours back. But if you do, like, if that's going to, you know, allow you to get your applications out there and deploy things and get to New York faster, if that's what you need, then you are going to pay for it. But it's possible. I could watch this all day right here. Like, this is just like, we're just going to leave it up for like an hour. This is, if no one saw this live, the, the SpaceX, the Falcon 9 landing was just like incredible. When those, they landed, it was less, it was like 1.2 seconds apart from each other. It was like, they both just came down. It's like, I'm sure Elon was like, oh, I was so close. <laughs> the rest of us were just like, yo, that was, that was just amazing, right? And it's like, but he, you know, I don't know. Uh, but these, this is like, an example of r robotics has this, this notion of control loops in it, right? Robotics, if a robot wants to stand up, what does it do? It constantly looks, am I falling? Am I falling? Yeah, okay, you gotta, am I falling? Am I falling? Yeah, and it constantly does those loops to figure out what it's doing. Literally, that's like, could a human land those? No. Like, if I was at the, I'm good at video games, right? But I'm not, no, like, there's no way I'm doing that at all. And, and this is, you need the software to be able to do those control loops and adjust. As soon as that, one of those rockets was like, oh, I'm, I'm slightly off, it, you know, corrected itself. And it says, oh, no, we need to be straight for this landing. Like, I'm sure somewhere in the software, it's just like, hey, I want to land. And that's it. And that's all I tell them. Like, figure it out now. And everyone else, like, the one guy that wrote that piece of code was just like, I just, here's the land API. And everyone else figures out the imperative way that that happened. Like, like I hate you, man. Like, why'd you get the easy job? But it's really, like, this is where if, if you can release control of a lot of the things that you normally do and you script and you automate and make them declarative systems and have the software manage this, the other software, you can do things like this. And from that, like, who knows, like, how far you're going to go. Like, literally, we're going to go to Mars. Like, that's really freaking far away. <laughs> I don't know. It's a little further than New York. Um, and here's a, I, I like this quote from SpaceX, like, why does SpaceX, SpaceX exist? Like, this is on their site. Uh, and Elon said, he's like, okay, you want to wake up in the morning and think the future is going to be great, and that what is, and that's, and that's what being a spacefaring civilization is all about. It's about believing in the future and thinking that the future will be better than the past. And I can't think of anything more exciting than going out there and building infrastructure. Not really what he said. <laughs> then going out there and being among the stars. And like he didn't, like, we're just going to get there, right? And he's just like, no, we're going to be among the stars. And like people should be out there. And that's the declarative thing. He's not just like, well, you know what? Like we're going to build a data center. And it's like, no, like he had his eye on what the end goal was. And that is why he was doing it. It wasn't, you know, he didn't get lost in the little details. And obviously, like there's a lot of people that are building that stuff for him. And there's a lot of work going on. But he constantly pushes them to say, like, no, that's where we're going, and that's the purpose. That's why. By the way, the new uh, the BFR rocket he has, I don't know if you've seen the video. He has this, like, he has a, a whole idea of, like, replacing planes, essentially, with them on land. So you just, like, go out to this big rocket. You get in it. It holds, like, 100-something people. And you take a rocket in low Earth orbit to, like, your destination. And it lands literally as, you know, this landing. You're just like, oh, okay, we're cool. We're landed now. Um, but that the BFR, like, if... Will, can take you from New York to Paris, just like our Concorde in three and a half hours. It'll take you there in 30 minutes. It's just like, if you can increase velocity that much, declarative systems to just, software manages it, and guess what? Like, get people out of the way. Like, you can get there. And, and I, I have no doubts that he could do it as long as, you know, governments and policies would allow him. And, yeah, so this is, I mean, really, a lot of it comes down to this, to, to focus on where you're trying to get to and how far you really need to go. Because again, we're starting day to day. Yes, you have legacy. Yes, you have stuff. But think about things a different way 
and, and you'll be able to go faster with those new things. I can't solve all your Perl and, and COBOL and your infrastructure. Like, I just can't do it. I'm sorry. But you can keep moving forward with new things. Like, you can do this because all of this other stuff exists now. And, and yeah, sorry, lost my place here. But breaking down just to, like, three kind of bullet points of, of what cloud-native infrastructure entails. Uh, there's lots of definitions out there. It's a good book you might want to read. Um, <laughs> but really, it's about it's running the least amount of infrastructure you can get away with. Right? So that, that puts you ahead as far as possible because you're not, you're not doing this. You're not building a car. Using, a, using processes with the people, because people are very important, using processes that enable the applications to move fast. And, and that just increases your velocity here. And then uh, you, making applications run the infrastructure. Like you really should be developing applications that do that for you and, and not trying to do automation and trying to do all these other things. We're just like, well, you know what? Like, what if I could declare these states? And that is really what's going on here. And, and in technology, we're not going to New York. We're just moving forward. Like, that's innovation. Like, you just keep moving forward one step at a time. You find something, and you do it better, and you do it better. And, and that's exactly where, you know, DevOps has brought us so far ahead with this, you know, you can test things and continuously deploy things. And that's amazing to help with the culture and the people and the thought process around these things. And cloud native is really about being declarative with everything and not just saying, I need to automate all that stuff that, you know, someone else made, but also making it yourself to be declarative. And, and if you don't move forward, like, guess what? Like, your competitors are. Like, someone else is moving forward. Like, there's always innovation in the world. The, the future is here. It's just not ev evenly distributed. So if you're not the one driving progress, like, guess what? Like, someone is. So there might be something you said about what you're doing if you're not. Um, and for technology, like, in cloud native, the, the destination is the desired state. Like, whatever is you're trying to build right now, like, that should be the one thing you're focusing on to, like, okay, that's done. Now we have a new desired state. We want to move to the next thing. And how do we build things to be able to declare us to get to that point? And, and everything in your infrastructure, your people, all your applications, your infrastructure, everything is, you know, at different control loops. In Kubernetes, it cares about pods. In, in you know, the broader eco ecosystem, it cares about, you know, load balancers and ingress controllers and all these other things. And then at, like, a broader scope with people, like, what should the people be working on? And, like, how should they be building those applications? That's really the importance because that is how we change what's possible going forward. Because we can forecast, okay, I, declare, I can de now declare this state and I don't care about anything else underneath it now. Because that's a solved problem. And I can click a button and get a thousand servers in Amazon and I don't have to call, you know, and wait for hardware to come in and rack and stack them anymore. Like it's a declared, it's just done. Like it's a solved problem. And, and so I hope that, you know, Going that, going that route and, and being able to build these applications that manage that infrastructure will really just accelerate everything you're doing. So that's it. Thank you. I'll be around uh, if you have questions. I don't really, don't really need to do it on the mic necessarily, but I'll be around. I'm also doing a, there's a Kubernetes, Birds of Feather, in this room in an hour if you want to come back. So uh, feel free to stick around. No, there's another one before. Yeah, AWS is right now. Yeah, AWS is in here right now, and then Kubernetes after.